We're going to be in a handful of texts this morning as we consider the pleasures of God at Christmas. Now, I remember growing up that it was so hard to buy my dad something. It was really the first taste of what do you get the person that seems to have everything. Now, I I knew our situation. I knew we weren't rich, but I just scrambled. It was always, I would find something at the hardware store in the, you know, under $5 bin. And it just always invariably ended up being some wrench that just never worked again. So basically, I knew it was going to be mine, um, even as a little kid. Have you ever struggled with that? You know, what do you give the person that seems to have everything? Sometimes it was because you didn't have the means. You just felt like that they they literally have everything that you couldn't afford anyway. What are you going to give them? So you just paint a picture. Now, that would be totally strange if you're a 30-year-old dude and you paint a picture for someone. Now, if you're a great artist, great. I give you all the kudos in the world. But that's me painting a picture or making a drawing for someone. That's just kind of weird. So probably not going to do that. Sometimes it's because you convince yourself you can't give them anything because you just flat out forgot to buy them anything at all. And you just convince yourself, oh, I just can't give you anything. So you just keep going over with the silly, the thought that counts because you know for you it doesn't count. You want stuff. When we think about God, I don't, I mean, obviously there's no, God's not a created being, okay? We know that he's uncreated. He's always been. And I don't want to, I'm not approaching this from the, what can we give God at Christmas? What's the greatest gift that we can possibly give? That's not at all the approach I'm taking today. It's actually a very simple reflection on a couple of passages that just simply speak of what has pleased God when it comes to the incarnation. That's all. What has been listed or stated as being God's pleasure at Christmas? So let's look at it. First of all, let me say this, that it pleases God to dwell with his people. And of course, I think one of the first places we would go to is John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 14. Very classic arrangement of considering this particular truth. Here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, I'll go ahead and read verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, skip down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, there's plenty of other descriptors of who God in the flesh is, the person of Christ, but I love that we have this joint description of Christ being filled with grace and truth. And again, as we've tried to say many times, and I try not to throw, mainly because I don't want you to think that I know Greek better than I do, because I, I lean heavy into lexicons, absolutely. But I've tried to tell you over and over again that, that when you do see original languages or even when you see it in the English and you see some conjunction, some connector like and, that in the Greek, it's even stronger than we may even consider it in the English. We're a little bit casual, but that's not so in the Greek. So when you see grace and truth connected, these are inseparably balanced, 100% balanced truths, interlinked, chain linked together. But the thing I want you to notice, though, about that text, especially verse 14, is that God, it pleases God to dwell with his people. And that idea of verse 14, when it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, is that in the Greek, that's basically a a transliterated term that's used in the Old Testament for tabernacle. So he tabernacled with us. So basically, it harkens back to the Old Testament ideal that God has always made for himself a people, and he longs to be with them. Again, Not because God is lonely. We've tried to make that clear because God has no needs. God is not needy. But in his desire and in his seeking to extend his glory and invite his creation into sharing in his glory, which is perfect and pure, 
He desires to make for himself a people, a redeemed people who can share in that glory. So he wants to be with the people. And so before we had tents or you would have pillars of smoke or pillars of fire, and then they would set up temporary tents. And this is why it was so necessary in the Old Testament later on when, when after being decimated by so many invasions that when Nehemiah and Ezra head back to Jerusalem and Nehemiah goes back to establish the walls, that when Ezra stands up to preach in Nehemiah 8 and the men, the leaders start to realize that there's this thing called the Feast of Booths. What is that? So they go back to the Levites and say, help us understand what this thing is. Well, the Feast of Booths is a reminder of God's presence in the midst of the Exodus. God desiring to be with his people. It's so important because then Christ becomes the fulfillment of the Feast of Booths. He is constantly the fulfiller of what it means to be present. Now, of course, then we could fast forward and go later on, we understand that not only is the church the ones that he inhabits, but we also know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit because Christ has come and now the helper has come. And then Christ ascended, the helper has come. All throughout the scriptures, we have this idea that God It pleases him to dwell with his people. So keep that in mind. It pleases God to dwell with his people. But there's a caveat because it pleases God in order to dwell with his people, he has to be at peace with his people. Otherwise, he has to make war. So it pleases God to be at peace with the people with whom he dwells. In Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. You know, a lot of times you will hear or you'll even see on mugs, if you go to like the Hallmark store or something like that, you'll see on mugs, you know, peace on earth. (laughs) <laughs> and it leaves out all the exclusions with whom he is pleased. See, we understand that when Christ came, yes, it is, it is an offering that he has made. In a sense, it's an offering that's made to all men, but it's actually the opposite of what we think about in that sense. Here's what I mean. We're not universalists. We don't believe that because Christ came, then everyone is therefore saved automatically. Okay. When Christ came, that this peace that is established, this salvation then that's offered is actually, it's offered to all ethnic groups everywhere. But actually, if you really think about it, it means the opposite of what you might think if you're just out there in the world. And here's what I mean. It's actually incredibly exclusionary. So wherever you are in the world, whatever ethnic group you're from, whatever religion you grew up in, To say that Christ is available as the only way of salvation for any ethnic group actually means he's the only way of salvation for any ethnic group for all of time, throughout all of history. And we need to remember then when we think about things like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because we need to go on through verses 18 all the way through verses 21 because, you know why? Because yes, it does say that he did not come to condemn the world, but you know why? Because John goes on to say the world's already condemned in its sin. We don't get to stop there and say, oh, he he didn't come to be judgy. He came to make peace because the world was already under judgment. He desires and it pleases him to make peace with those with whom he desires to dwell. And the only way for that, ple- that peace is through the son that came. But before we move on to that part, when we look at it pleases God to be at peace with his people, let's just for half a second look at the announcement by these angels. It says, first of all, glory to God in the highest. God's pleasure is absolutely in his glory. But this is not some kind of narcissistic kind of self-glory in a selfish kind of self-aggrandizing kind of way. This is the beauty and the perfection of the all-loving God who loves without any expectation of return and is completely self-satisfied within the Trinity, perfectly happy within himself, and yet he is saying, 
the greatest, most wonderful good for you is to share in the glory that I have. And he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to make that offering. So to say glory to God in the highest, the angels are announcing, this is what I want you to share in that is the greatest opportunity for you in the world. And he says, but he's even come for you to share in that glory. It's for him to have to make peace so that you can share in that glory. And how does he do so? He does so in with whom he is well pleased, both in the Christ that he has pleasure in. And that's going to be the way, the avenue through which the people that he desires to be with will be at peace with him who has brought the person of peace, who is Christ. And that's the third thing. It pleases God to make peace with his people that he desires to dwell with through Christ. Okay? So it pleases God to dwell with his people. But in order to dwell with them, it pleases God to make peace with those people with whom he desires to dwell. And it pleases God to make peace with those people with whom he desires to dwell through the person of Christ. Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says this. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now this is in Christ. So he has the complete totality of the fullness of who God is. Why? Because he is God. There is no way we have a brief sermon on Christmas morning and preach on the Trinity. Ain't going to happen. So I'm not going there. Okay. All right. So... But what we do understand is because he is fully God and because he is fully man, it says through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or heaven, making peace by what? By the blood of the cross. So every Old Testament shadow and type and imagery of sacrifice in order to atone for the sins of men was all a type or a shadow or a distant echo leading to the reality that was going to come as the person of Christ. And I love this picture of when he makes peace with all things, that even when we see creation itself restored, and I mean, whatever happened this week with, you know, something cyclones, whatever it was called, it, it was movie, movie stuff. I saw it. It's called The Day After Tomorrow or whatever. So, oh, that's ridiculous. And then it almost happened. You know, you walk outside, you freeze, and you're dead. It wasn't quite that bad. But the idea that he will even make peace with creation, the, the beauty of this passage is just how totally at peace all things will be through the person of Christ, which is a reminder of just how radically insufficient we are to do anything for ourselves according to God's intent. Basically, if you cannot make peace with all that is broken, you are not sufficient to make peace with anything that's broken. Because God is the creator. And when fallenness came in, sin affected every molecule and all of the fallenness of, that we've ever seen or known has, been, has affected everything, all of creation. And unless you can fix and bring peace to all of creation, you do not have the capacity to fix any part of that brokenness, not for any kind of length of time, maybe in a moment. And yes, I think as as churches, we should seek to do that, whether it's in acts of, of mercy or justice, little acts of reconciliation are great because we have words of life. So we use those things as springboards to speak those eternal matters. But don't you dare think that you can somehow in your way bring an eternal reconciliation or peace. You do not have the capacity. It pleases God to do this through Christ and through Christ alone. How do you know if that's happened to you? Well, it's pretty simple. To keep in line with what we're talking about this morning is simply this. If you have been, if it's God's pleasure to make peace with you, for God to dwell with you, through the person of Christ, then the way that you know that you've been made at peace with God through Christ is that you begin to take on what pleases God. So Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Ah, oh, this is great stuff. I mean, when a, when, a, when a church kid or a pastor's kid knows this verse heading into Christmas, you are tempted as a parent to go ahead and milk legalism for just a little while. Just a short time. But you know it would be wrong. Because they think that, okay, if I act good enough, then I will get the gift that I want. I will get Daisy Red Rider with a compass and a BB, uh, you know, whatever, compass and a map in the stock. I will get the whatever it is I want. I will, you know, because you think that as long as you can behave a certain way, then you, your wants will remain intact for the things that you have wanted all along, which is incredibly selfish. That's not what David is saying. David says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, then you will want what God wants. And what does God want? Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among men with those with whom he is well pleased. If you have been made at peace with God through Christ, you will be pleased with what God is pleased with, which is his glory and his peace with others. And how is that any different than very simply the greatest commandments? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. To exalt him in his glory and to want to see others come to know him. So basically, if you want to know whether or not you're at peace with him, ask yourself, do you take pleasure in wanting to see God exalted? And do you take pleasure in seeing others, other people come to a place where they want to be God exalters, so to speak? So it pleases God. With Christmas, he, he shows us that he desires to dwell with his people. He wants to be at peace with his people. It pleases God to make peace with his people through Christ. And lastly, it pleases God to accomplish his pleasure and convey all this through words. You have the angels making an announcement. Granted, the shepherds freak. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know. I mean, if you get time, just uh, take half a second this afternoon and just, I mean, be careful. Because if, if you make a mistake, it's not on me. But if you, if you Google a, a, an accurate biblical rendition of an angel, oh, man. I mean, there's, there's nothing about that that you're going to go, oh, it's the ghost of Christmas past or something sweet. Man, it is freaky. It is like there's eyeballs everywhere and there's feathers and there's wings all over the place. And it's not, there's no way that you're not anything but just, if I saw that, I mean, I'm out. Done. It is terrifying to see what the Lord accomplishes. And yet what he could accomplish, he desires to accomplish it simply through words. It pleases God to do so. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. I mean, what could be more God-glorifying than simply to use words, which is so inactive in its application? And yet God takes those words, and has he not consistently shown this throughout his pre-existence? Let there be light. It's in a vacuum. There's, there's no elements for those sounds to bounce off of. He speaks it, and there is. That's power. It goes against nature. Lazarus, come forth. That's all he says. Jesus walking on water during a storm. Hey, take it easy. It's me. I don't know how much it helped, but that's what he does. Or Peter, come on, take a few steps. Words. Because then the Spirit of God takes those words and those words of faith, and those words of faith then give birth to salvation. For by grace you've been saved through faith and it's not of yourself. Faith is then the, the 
what is brought to birth, faith is brought to birth through words spoken. And it has pleased God to use the simplicity and the foolishness of words. And yet we as people are very active wanting to have our hands on. Why? Because we want to stamp it. We want to sign it. We want credit for something that we have constructed, we have put our hands to, and God has simply said, let there be light. You could summarize the preaching of the word of God, the preaching of the gospel with what we've used before, God, man, Christ response. This means that grace and salvation can only be received by faith. You can only accept the truth that has been spoken. You can't act on it in the sense of doing something except repent, turn from what you've done before and believe what you've heard. So in order to come to Christ, you have to believe the Christmas story. You have to believe that when Christ came, it was God in the flesh, not just a historical good teacher dude who was going to do some good benevolent things, but sound awfully crazy if he's not God. You have to believe if you're going to be a true Christian, that's part of what you believe is that God came in the flesh and he came to reconcile all things, including us to himself through the blood of the cross to save us. You will only know peace. You will only share in his pleasure when you believe that Christ is the only provision of God to save you. And look, guys, if you do believe that, then let this morning be a simple reminder of his great and good gifts to you. That he is the only great and good gift. That of all the wonderful things that we receive, all the 10,000 blessings besides, that Christ himself is the only singular blessing that will last and will sustain and is the only one that possibly could save. And let that be something that will carry you, refresh you, enliven you heading into whatever, whatever the next year affords because we have no idea. We just don't. But we do know that He will still be enthroned. He will never have a last breath. He continues to save and intercede for those that are his. And some of us may even have the pleasure of being with him forevermore in his presence. We don't know, but we do know about him. And he's a man and a God that keeps promises. And I pray that you'll know that fully and well, even now. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this Christmas morning. We thank you for your words that speak to us what your pleasure is on this Christmas morning, that you desire to dwell with your people and you desire to make peace with those with whom you dwell with because otherwise you cannot be in their presence because of sin. But the way that you reconcile that is through the Christ that you sent that we recognize at Christmas time. And I pray that we would hear the words of the gospel and simply repent and turn from trying to prove ourselves good or worthy in other ways. That we simply would look upon you and say, I do believe in Christ come. I do believe that Christ lived perfectly. I do believe that Christ bore a death that I deserved. And I do believe that Christ was raised on that third day and ascended to the Father and is alive interceding even for me. I believe that he did all that in my place. I can do nothing for myself, and I believe. And thank you for the reminders of that gift and what a gift the local church is, what a gift preaching is and song. So many things that really encapsulate this pleasure that you have in words, giving life and reminding us of life that's been given. We thank you. And So God, as we sing this last song together, may it lead us into the merriest of Christmases as we think about the beauty of your pleasure. And may we get a little closer to sharing that our greatest pleasure meets up with what pleases you the most. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth with whom, with those with whom you are well pleased that we may see more and more come to faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.